My name is Brad Meyer. I'm with our parent company, which is Terrazzo and Marble Supply Companies. We're out of Chicago, Illinois, or as we say, Chicago, and we say project, and we say process, but you guys are the ones with the accents. So uh, I wore my green striped shirt today because Terrazzo, the flooring we're going to talk about today, is very environmentally friendly. That's really perceived value, I guess, because just like with Terrazzo, how long does this floor last? It lasts the life of a building. It is alive and well, very much so in Canada and around the world. United States, we're doing millions of square feet per year. I would say that the Canadian market is probably six to eight years behind, but it is coming back and growing quite readily. The Hockey Hall of Fame here in town, there is Terrazzo being installed as we speak at Union Station. Humber River Hospital. How about the airport, Terminal 3? All of ticketing is being reinstalled right now over some Terrazzo tiles that were put down many years ago, poured in place Terrazzo. How about the schools and universities that you guys studied in and grew up with? Terrazzo is alive and well in Canada as well, and there are many contractors out there doing this product. So we talk about perceived value and the greenness of it. I didn't wear this shirt because it was green. It's because I grabbed it and threw it in my suitcase before I left a couple days ago. But it is last the life of a building. And that is true. And we just recently finished. Anybody here has gone to Las Vegas? Has flown through? Oh, yeah, raise those hands. Some good experiences, some bad. But we don't have to talk about that. Vegas wasn't built because you guys went home with a lot of money. But they have some wonderful terrazzo work there, and I had a little short video here to show you about a project that was just recently completed there. The intricate mosaic made of port-in-place terrazzo is located in the heart of Terminal 1 baggage claim and is the capstone of the renovation project to update the area. Because it resonates with what this town's all about. I mean, basically, you go to other towns and you're like, what, what's going on? Here, yeah, we gotta have the glitter, we gotta have the shine, we gotta have the neon. And when you come into this place, this is beautiful. The artwork was designed by award-winning artist and native Nevadan, Randy Heil. After an auto accident left him paralyzed below the shoulders, Heil learned to use his mouth to paint and design. The iconic landmarks that have defined the Las Vegas skyline, both past and present, were Heil's inspiration for the airport piece. When I was a kid, my grandparents would take me down the strip to Circus Circus, and I would you know, have my face against the car window, and I'd try to count all the windows all these casinos as we went by. So it left, it left quite an impression in me. The 40-foot diameter circle features a border reminiscent of a poker chip and highlights points of interest that grace the world-famous Las Vegas Strip. The vintage skyline includes the dunes, landmark, plaza, and Desert Inn hotels, as well as other references to Las Vegas history, such as Heil's childhood hero, Evil Knievel, jumping the fountains at Caesar's Palace, and a mushroom cloud representing atomic testing. The size, the interesting architecture, like the landmark, even old Caesars with the aqua tinted lights at night, it all just uh, really stuck in my head. So one half of the mosaic represents that time period. And I kind of sprinkled it with little surprises like in the Desert Inn, if you look in, in one of the windows, you can see a silhouette of Howard Hughes. The modern skyline half of the poker chip art incorporates the diverse and distinctive architecture of the strip, including the Luxor Las Vegas Pyramid, the Paris Las Vegas Eiffel Tower, the Volcano at the Mirage, and the Stratosphere Tower. Newer additions such as the Wind Las Vegas, the High Roller Observation Wheel, and the Las Vegas Monorail are represented as well. I'm hoping that it'll sort of serve as a, a little history lesson for people who may not be aware of the older casinos. Skilled workers from Cordini Corporation spent eight weeks bringing Hiles' design to life and ensuring every last detail was properly executed. Oh, this one here was a very special one. We've been doing this kind of flooring for a long time. We, we've done a lot of different um, pictures, but this medallion is a special one. It's something to remember. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority provided the artwork's design as part of the airport's ongoing effort to extend the Las Vegas experience to the airport. So, is it, so there we see, folks, that uh, Terrazzo is alive and well. In fact, 
this project, one project of the year in the United States, uh, was very exciting. And we find that basically our only limitation is the budget. It is not your, uh, and your imagination sometimes. So um, it's all poured in place, it is all custom, and it is a material that is sanitary and hygienic, and it is green friendly. So our parent company here, Terrazzo and Marble, we do have a sister company here that represents the Canadian market. That is called Domus Terrazzo Supply. And they're here in Toronto, been around for decades, and now we have brought some of the marketing elements to grow this and show you folks that um, we do have a definite presence and the product is growing. It looks, the, the organization here, Terrazzo Tile and Marble Association of Canada, the first word, Terrazzo. It's been around a long time. Basically, there was quarry tile and there was Terrazzo for many years. How about the origins of Terrazzo? Are there any descendants of, uh, of, of, of Italian descent here? Anyone? Okay, we see a couple guys. Gentlemen, do you recognize anyone in these photos? Okay, you, you saw, uh, we have a Luigi and a Mario and a Giuseppe. Okay, um, these, the Italians kind of claim fame to the origins of Terrazzo. How it came about was in Italy, Probably around the turn of the 20th century, early 1900s, into the 20s, the, the word, the Italian word, terrazzo, is terrace, translated in English. They collected, these guys were not the aristocracy, they were the couriers, the guys that went up the mountains in Carrara, Italy, and at that time, used a product called dynamite, not, di uh, not diamond-coated wire band saws and the technology that we have today to extract the marble blocks. They used dynamite. And as you can imagine, all of these little pieces of marble fell to the sides of the quarry. And because they didn't have Home Depot and Lowe's and some of these home centers that we have today where you can go buy a slate tile for $1 a square foot, I can actually buy it for 70 cents because I'm from the United States and I have a cost savings when I come to Canada. But one, two, three dollars a square foot, these 12 by 12 by 3 8 tiles were not available. So these guys collected this at the end of the day in the quarry and they took it in their pockets and put it on the donkey drawn carts down the side of the mountain. And when they gathered enough of this beautiful marble chips, they mixed it with earlier versions of Portland cement because Portland cement didn't get invented until the 50s and poured it on their terrazzo, their terrace. And when this mixture, this pancake batter of early versions of cement and marble aggregates cured or dried, they brought in a galetta, a galetta that is the Italian word translated to English means prison because by hand they ground the marble chips, which were very dense and hard, and this early concoction of cement, and polished it. The galera is the stick with the carborundum or blocks on the end, and they polished it with a couple of different grits, put some goat's milk, which was kind of fatty acids, and it brought the shine out of marbles, the marble chips in there. The finished marble surface is about or the finished terrazzo surface is about 70% marble chip. And when that all cured and was finished, that is the beauty of terrazzo. And I have my uh, lovely colleague here, uh, Roger, um, who is our local branch manager here. Roger, if you could maybe start, uh, just pass around a couple of the hard sample kits, maybe start one on this side and one on that side. And so people can put their hands and I, I tend to be a little visual. I don't know if it's a male thing or just a personal thing, but I like to see what I'm talking about here. So we have some hard samples of terrazzo, some finished terrazzo uh, 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 materials that can be passed around. And you will see the various kinds of aggregate that are also used in this kind of a product. What are the general components of terrazzo? 
basically a binder. Cement was the original binder used in Terrazzo, and probably until about the 80s, let's call it, 1980s, we started to use a binder called epoxy uh, resin. And for the most part, today, most projects are epoxy terrazzo. However, there is still a fair amount of projects that are the traditional sand cushion terrazzo made of Portland cement as the binder. The aggregates haven't changed much. We still use primarily marble aggregates of various colors from various places in the world. We'll cover that in a little bit. But with the evolution of epoxy terrazzo, we can do lighter weight floors, three-eighths of an inch versus the traditional sand cushion system, which was three inches thick. So lighter weight floors, color flexibility, because with Portland cement, you can only add so much powdered pigment to it. If any of you have worked with stained concrete, you would understand what I'm talking about. Um, you can't get a fire engine red, a sapphire blue, some of those bright and vibrant colors that you saw at the Las Vegas airport. You can do that with epoxy. Epoxy tends to be a little bit more acid and stain resistant. And you can use aggregates that don't have a lot of porosity because the binder has to hold on to these little aggregates. Bind or aggregates such as recycled glass and or mother of pearl crushed seashells and or metal chip chips or shavings such as zinc or brass can be used in the aggregates of, of the epoxy terrazzo system. So uh, generally you need a binder. Then the divider strips. Uh, Roger, if you could go ahead and start passing around the divider strips. The, the two common finishes are brass and zinc. Occasionally I will see an architectural specification that says stainless steel. It's usually an oversight because it looks silver. But we use brass and zinc because they are metals that are approximately the same hardness as the actual terrazzo materials, the binder and the chips and they grind at the same rate. The reoccurring theme, limited only by your imagination. So um, brass, zinc, aggregates, binder, and then that's basically your components there. There are some fillers in there, but to keep it simple for today's presentation, those are your primary elements of the mix. It is then poured in place and then ground and finished. This is the thin set system that we talk about now with the epoxy terrazzo. What new construction concrete is free of cracking? New construction concrete, I can answer that for you. It's in the middle of my hand here, it's zero. So new construction concrete, concrete is made as the moisture leaves the system to shrink a little bit and you have some normal shrinkage cracks in concrete. So because epoxy terrazzo is bound directly to the concrete subfloor, you can use an anti-fracture membrane. 100% coverage is a great insurance policy, but it will drive up the cost of your terrazzo a bit, your finished system. And if, as I started out, our limitations can be budget, cost initial, and your imagination. Those are your only two limitations really in terrazzo other than that last life of the building. So therefore, if we're budget conscious, you don't necessarily need 100% coverage of the anti-fracture membrane. You can specify, assume 10 to 15% coverage of anti-fracture membrane in your installation. And that will usually cover you. Then you will not have uh, the, the subcontracts, some guys bidding the anti-fracture membrane, some not, some bidding full membrane, some not at all. This helps clarify so you don't have changes down the road and you have apples and apples in your spec. So anti-fracture membrane, uh, the primer, the anti-fracture membrane, and then the 3 8 inch or roughly uh, 10 to 12 millimeter thickness of epoxy terrazzo topping mixed with your aggregates. Okay, so these are some of the systems that started before epoxy. So there are certainly many sand cushion systems, universities, etc., hospitals that have been in Canada for many, many years, decades, that are sand cushion systems. Those are th the original sand cushion 
is going to be the, the slide on your left there or the schematic you see on your left. So it is, it is a floating floor. That is one of the successes of why sand cushion cement terrazzo systems are still been in Canada here in Toronto, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. They are a floating floor. I said new construction concrete is not free of shrinkage cracks. That's normal. Sand cushion system, one of its secrets is you will put down a slip sheet, similar to like a Slater's felt roofing paper, or if you want some moisture vapor characteristics, uh, Visqueen, etc. And then the two and a half inch mud underbed sets on top of that slip sheet. Therefore, if there is shrinkage cracks or a little bit of movement horizontally underneath your sand cushion terrazzo, it does not transmit to the surface of the actual half inch terrazzo topping. So those are your original systems right there. There are some modifications of that on the left, but essentially the original terrazzo system that the Italians brought over here, your relatives, gentlemen, um, in the late uh, 1920s, 30s was this system here. Okay. Aggregates, as I said, 75, 70 to 75%. So that is the beauty and the elegance and the, and the artistry of terrazzo floors. 70 to 75% is natural marble and natural aggregates. However, with, just understand that we do, with lead and environmental friendly uh, type products, we do use products such as recycled glass and recycled metals occasionally in the mix. Sizes. Traditionally, a terrazzo blend, you want to get that 70 to 75 percent aggregates at the surface of your finished terrazzo floor. You want a blend of zeros, ones, and twos generally. Zeros being the smallest and so on and so forth to number two. Okay, um, we see in design trends going a little bit above or beyond the spectrum, both on opposite sides. We have a lot of architects and designers that are looking for very monochromatic. They want the look of a stained concrete, but they don't want the fading of the stains. They don't want the cracking that occurs in concrete, so they, but they want that monochromatic look. So we do see what we're calling in the industry micro blend terrazzo. Generally double zeros, so very, very fines. The example to your furthest left would be an example of micro blend terrazzo. And now we have a high-end Italian fashion clothing store that has opened up in the last couple of years in Manhattan in New York. And they are using a very, uh, uh, what they called traditionally many years ago, a Venetian terrazzo look, or even larger, a Palladiana terrazzo look. So Venetian is using larger aggregates, size three to eight. That is the photo to your far right. Those are included in the mix. What you have to understand with Venetian terrazzo, if you are doing epoxy terrazzo, because that's probably 80% plus of the floors that are going in now, is that you will have to assume or design a thicker floor, at least generally 5 eighths, sometimes up to 3 quarter inch thickness, to accommodate those lar larger size aggregates. And Roger, if you wouldn't mind, you can maybe start uh, passing around the um, Venetian sizes in the Italian chip kit. And then I'll call you back, if you don't mind, uh, when we refer to some of the other recycled materials. Another so this, this store in Manhattan actually used Palladiana terrazzo. Palladiana, we're seeing a little resurgence. It's kind of like acid wash blue jeans and bell bottoms. You know, it kind of comes and goes, but right now it's very trendy. What we do is we take, you remember the original, where did terrazzo come from? The marble quarries in Italy. We're taking 12 by 12 by 3 eighths, basically junk 
Italian white marble, let's say. In this case, that's what the actual material is in this store. And I say junk because it is basically the seconds, the materials, because cost. We're always considering cost. Materials where the corner broke off in manufacturing at the quarry, there might be a scratch, there might be a chip on the edge. We will buy it by the pallet. They get it on the job site and they t actually literally take a hammer and whack the tile and wherever it breaks, those are the pieces of the polydiana. I don't know, if, let's see if this is, yes. So essentially they're much larger pieces than this. They're actually tiles. They will set the tiles in a random manner on the, on the, on the floor, let that cure, and then pour in a terrazzo mix around it. Come back the next day and grind the entire surface smooth. So you see when I say junk tile, it doesn't matter what material. We just need the marble itself. We're going to repolish it anyway. So they bust up the tile, install the tile, and then pour the terrazzo around it. That's called Polydiana terrazzo. And I usually historically have not spent this much time talking about it, but there's a little bit of a design trend for it. So you might see that. Okay, recycled content, there's your glass. So everyone, the common colors in the end of your driveway, right? The beer bottles, the clear glass jars, jars wine bottles, green glass. Those are the common ones that we call post-consumer. Because they're readily available, thanks Roger. Roger will start the post-consumer around. Because they're readily available in your recycle bins, they're usually the most economical as well. So it's not much different. So we kind of say the aggregates that are indigenous closest to the job site, in your case, there is a quarry in Ontario that we get a bunch of aggregates from. There are quarries throughout the United States. There are many quarries that we bring in traditional Italian marble aggregates because that's where it started. So a lot of those are still around. So usually the local quarry materials are your least, inex least expensive for budget. Then post-consumer, readily available, your beer bottles, your clear glass jars, your wine bottles, what you see here. And then we have pre-consumer, where we do have designers that want a fire engine red glass, but they want the recycled content of glass. And there's your fire engine reds, some yellows, uh, the colors that you won't find in your recycled bin. Those are kind of a premium. The other premium that we see very commonly used in, you will see them in some of the samples that are being passed around is mother of pearl crushed seashells. It's been very commonly used for many years, many decades, but there is a little bit of a premium. So what we advise architects and designers to do is you don't necessarily have to use 100% content of these higher priced aggregates. Specify 10 or 15% in your mix. Just add a little bit of a bling. Mother of pearl gives it that reflectiveness and it adds a lot of life to the terrazzo, and at only 10 or 15% doesn't add a lot of cost to the budget. Another aggregate that will be coming around, I believe it is in the post-consumer box, Roger, but nonetheless, it's coming around there, you'll see porcelain. If you've heard of a company called uh, Kohler in Wisconsin, they make toilets and sinks and thousands and millions and billions of them. Um, when they fire these things at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, you, all of the little nooks and crannies, they get little hairline cracks, and they actually have a high rejection rate of sinks and toilets. And we put these, and they, they come into a pile like this. We actually crush them when we're using porcelain, recycled porcelain aggregates. They're very durable, acid and stain resistant, as you know. And the, the sinks and to, the, the toilets in particular have not been used, so we should be okay there. Bone is their most popular color. You know that you can get these uh, sinks and toilets in other colors and black and white and etc. But uh, bone is their most popular color and if you specify an aggregate for a 20,000 square foot terrazzo job and you specify black porcelain, we might not have enough to supply it. 
So that's why we promote the one that is most accessible for us. How about recycled concrete? When you take concrete and crush it, it looks like a little marble aggregate. We are using that to an extent. But understand some limitations about green, as we've all come to find out, is that green doesn't necessarily mean cheaper. Green actually often means more green and more money. So we've been asked questions like, okay, we're doing a project in Vancouver. Can you take the existing building concrete, crush it, and then use it on the floor? Well, there's some logistical things with that. You have to remove that concrete. You have to ship it to another plant, back to Ontario, crush it, and then ship it back to Vancouver. So the logistics of it are not always totally friendly, but if we're using some concrete that is recycled from a project somewhere along the way, at least you are still achieving some of your recycled content. And there you see a little example of where some of these aggregates are coming from. And you see in the lower right-hand side there, how about that, Maydock, Ontario, Canada. So within a 500-mile radius, much closer even, you do have locally sourced materials very close to the Toronto area. In fact, we are doing, uh, we talk about Terrazzo alive and well in Toronto. How about the, uh, the subway extensions that you guys are doing? Those aggregates, I believe, Roger, are primarily MADOC uh, Canadian aggregates. 100%? Almost. 75% plus of those new expansions going on as we speak are domestically sourced aggregates to Ontario. Okay, don't worry about the uh, focusing on this and straining your eyes too much. Uh, what we're saying here, we in, we in the States, and we're going to probably work on this. We had a big task this year. I was part of the committee to update the Terrazzo specification for the TT Mac. If you attended the stone panel just prior to this presentation, um, some good people on there that are very conscientious to the, to the Terrazzo Tile and Marble Association. Uh, we had to get that spec for Terrazzo updated. The last spec was 2007, and now 10 years, it took us 10 years, but we finally got the new update done because Terrazzo is alive and well, and the next thing we'll work on is a cost calculator for Terrazzo, and it's going to depend on the province because there is a little bit of variation. And I have this, we did this in the states, so just to give you an idea, you see by the various states that the prices can change a little bit. If we're doing a project in Oklahoma City, where unfortunately you saw the, uh, you guys got more United States news, you guys have almost as much states news on in the morning here for me as, as I get in, at home. You even got like the tornadoes and where they hit yesterday and last week. I, I thank you for that. It's very nice. So, um, but uh, they had some problems with weather there, but it's a non-union state. The labor is inexpensive. And you can probably, and sometimes they even uh, put down thin epoxy terrazzo systems to save further cost at a quarter of an inch. You heard the fellas, uh, Bill Wright, talk earlier. It's very hard to get a, a concrete subfloor to follow a quarter inch and 10 feet on a speck, let alone put a quarter inch terrazzo system over the top. It's very similar to the porcelain problem that you have with the large formats. You need a very flat sub subfloor, but at a quarter inch epoxy terrazzo, you're using half of the material. So non-union labor, uh, uh, inexpensive cost of living, they could put epoxy terrazzo down for eight, eight to ten dollars USD. Pretty inexpensive. Um, if I did the same project in Manhattan, in New York City, and it was on the 30th floor of a building in an attorney's lobby, and they only have 750 square feet, and you have to take care of uh, the parking, the elevator uh, operators and all of this in a construction project that you have to do in the time and the downtime to get all the material and, and uh, get the material up and running on the project. 
might be $55 compared to 10 per square foot installed USD. So what is the going rate of epoxy terrazzo then in Ontario? I use, you have to start out with some general parameters because it depends on what the aggregate is, how big is the project, when is the project going, contractor awarded, etc. So I use some general parameters. Let's call it 5,000 square feet, aggregate sourced locally from Madoc, Ontario, 100% aggregates, maybe a two color pattern, so it depends on how many colors. If you saw that Las Vegas airport project, not going to be $8 a square foot, I can tell you that. But uh, in, 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 in Toronto, what do you think, Paul? Probably $30 a square foot average? Okay, so around $30 a square foot installed. So you see our limitations are generally cost initial and your imagination. Okay, we're going to skip through that just to give you an idea of where the budget. You know, years ago we didn't have to talk about budgets, right? Who cared about budgets? But we all faced that dreaded portion of the project value engineering. Oh, we're in interior finishes here, folks. We don't like that term very well. So, how about restoration? I believe uh, Roger gets a lot of calls on these as our local branch manager here because, as mentioned, how about all the schools and universities, the hospitals, you all grew up around. They ha relocate walls, they move things around, they have little additions, and they want to match the existing. So terrazzo can be restored like the day it was put in. Grind the surface, repolish it, patchwork, move some things around. That is, again, another beautiful thing about Terrazzo. Here's a, here's a project in, uh, if anybody is an uh, American football fan, college football fan, it's near where Notre Dame is, uh, South Bend, Indiana. Here's a church that was installed in 1950. It was restored a few years back, and it looked like the day it was put in. Understand about restoration, and when you're doing patching in Terrazzo, remember, Italian white Carrara, the little marbles, the mountain has been there for a million years. It's not going anywhere, but the color can change in it, just like when you're matching a marble panel on a wall in a lobby, and you have to go in and replace something and try and match existing. We can get pretty darn close, but sometimes you can't quite get exact because that finished surface is 70 to 75 percent natural marble aggregates. So there is some variation. So you see, I'm not sure if you can see here, but there's the little circle here. Look at Terrazzo. Terrazzo is not meant to take a magnifying glass and get up on it and say, well, what, what is this little chip looks a little bit different color? This is marble, people. Variations are to be expected. Okay? So look at Terrazzo at the whole area. That is the beauty and elegance of Terrazzo. Large-scale projects. Toronto Convention Center is another one with the uh, various snake and turtles and everything else in there. But sometimes with the patchwork, we're going to get pretty darn close, but sometimes not quite exactly the same. There are some examples of metal shavings used in terrazzo floors. And we see some examples of how terrazzo can be lead friendly. Last the life of the building. So it's a 30 year life cycle product. Can use recycled materials. It is assembled on the project. And if you are using epoxy resin as your binder, 100% uh, VO, 100 percent solids, no VOCs. So you don't have off-gassing, hurting our very important environment. Terrazzo can be precast or poured in place, or in many cases, both. So in many cases, you will see a project very similar to this, which is poured in place, flooring, and then precast treads and risers. 
and also base can be precast as well as poured in place. That is usually a cost differential. If you pour terrazzo in place on a base, again years ago, that would require a laborer to sit on a five gallon bucket and move along a couple hundred foot corridor in a school, for example, and grind that by hand. You can see labor has gone up, raw material pressures have remained relatively stable in economies of scale, so we find ourselves in precast base, uh, in base rather, terrazzo base, going precast, whether it's cove base or straight base as your options. Convention centers, mentioned the Toronto Convention Center, very popular application, airports, hospitals. And we see the color and design flexibility. One thing with the traditional sand cushion terrazzo, you need the placement of those divider strips that I passed around every five feet on center as a rule because I did tell you that it is some Portland cement as your binder and you are not totally free of shrinkage cracks. However, this is a good example of usually in Terrazzo, if you're going there, a designer or a project architect or an owner wants to see some more flare to the floor and you're going to find the placement of a divider strip more often than five feet on center. So this is probably an epoxy Terrazzo job. So with epoxy, because it's 100% solids, you can go much larger spans. As a rule, we say 20 feet on center, but it can be more. We say 20 feet because usually you find an expansion joint at that point, control joint, construction joint, and you have to put one of those divider strips. Even though the terrazzo is extremely durable, just like any other floor finish, we can't hold the building together. So we have to honor the, any joints that are existing in the concrete. So that is, that is usually, I mean, th this, is, this is who's driving epoxy terrazzo floors. This design flexible element is, I've been a member of the Construction Specification Institute. I used to just say CSI, but now everybody thinks I'm talking about crime scene investigator, so I have to make that clarification. Um, but for, for better than 20 years, I have some great friends and I have some very reputable spec writers. That, uh, that understand our product phenomenally. Who's driving our terrazzo business? The, the, the durability part is no problem. Uh, we talk, I opened with the perceived value. I, I don't need to prove anything to you. Uh, we've got 60, 70 year old floors here in Ontario that terrazzo lasts. It's the 22 year old designer with purple hair and six earrings. That's who's driving terrazzo because they can do anything with it. It's just real easy that after that designer wants terrazzo, it's easy for the project architect and it's easy for the spec writer because they say, no problem. I don't have a lot of questions to ask about this. I know it's, it's gonna last and I know we're not gonna have a problem with our owner. Microbial growth, there we say hospitals, okay? So sanitary, hygienic, extremely low maintenance. That there again, the challenge of Terrazzo. We as an industry can show you the cost calculators, uh, ones where you can actually see them so you're not looking across the room. And if you're having problems with an owner to talk about uh, the cost initial, we can show you that generally after 10 years, you're a break even point compared to some soft surface materials, a carpet, a VCT, Etc. And basically, after 20 years or 30 years life cycle, terrazzo is about a third or a quarter of the cost when you figure in the annual maintenance. No grout joints. That's a huge one. I heard some questions in the earlier session. Well, can you butt joint marble? Can you butt joint porcelain? And the answer quickly was, no, you can't do any of that. Uh, it's true. So you do need some grout on 
seamed materials. And with terrazzo, it's poured in place. They're poured up to the metal divider strip so you don't have grout joints. It's more sanitary, it's more hygienic, and it's lower maintenance. Slip resistance. Let's see, in California, I think it's about, we're down to about one in every 10 as an attorney. So uh, we worry about these things. And we have to. It's, it's about safety in the end, quite frankly. So it really, so, so we're often asked this as an industry. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of tension right now in uh, nothing major. We get along. We're still friends here. Uh, between the Canadians and the, and, and the States with regard to slip resistance and how to measure that with terrazzo. We've used the James machine historically, and that's what you say, I believe it's, it's on here, but it's the, it's the James test. And now uh, Canada has been, and we're, we're seeing in the States as well, but the BOT 3000 for slip testing. And it's very subjective test. Uh, the BOT 3000 machine that, that uh, we are, again, using in the States a little bit, but is being really pushed in Canada, as far as Terrazzo goes, it's a lab test. It's a test in a laboratory off-site of the project, and then it's, met, it's great when you're talking about a tile. Terrazzo is poured on the job. It's assembled on the job, so there is no lab test. It also comes down to the contractor that installed the project, what did they finish the floor to? Did they finish it to a 120 grit, a 220 grit? How about the sealer on the floor? How about the wax on the floor? Because as soon as we turn over a terrazzo floor, historically, the custodial union comes in, and what do they do? Take a five-gallon bucket of wax and dump it on the floor, and that's your finish. So it really depends on the finish coat at the project with Terrazzo. So we're pushing back a little bit on the BOT 3000 test right now. Um, in Canada, as I said, I'm on the board here in Canada with, with, with representing Terrazzo. Um, so because it, it, it's subjective at this point. Uh, so this information is based on the James test for about the last 15 to 20 years. Knock on wood, we haven't uh, had issues with this. And what we do is still go by the old Americans with Disability Act, 0.6 or above. And you see here that uh, unsealed terrazzo, uh, whether it be wet static or static, um, exceed, meets or exceeds that 0.6 or above. That's where we're at with, with slip resistance. Uh, I'll be glad to talk about it with you further. It's, it can, it's a subject that can be debated for hours in a separate presentation. This is an interesting project. Wayfinding is another way that Terrazzo can be lead friendly. This was the Kansas City rental car facility. The stairs are actually precast. They were put together at the contractor's location and then brought out to the project. And the actual flooring at the base of the stairs is poured in place. And at the top of the stairs, same thing. Moisture testing, since 80% plus of the projects in Terrazzo are being installed with epoxy Terrazzo systems or thin set Terrazzo, they are not breathable. So just like rubber back carpet tile, VCT, it's not breathable and you need to be sensitive of moisture content in concrete slabs. So ASTM 2170 is a test for relative humidity. That is what we're suggesting as a trade for tests. Uh, we do not want to exceed 80% RH, or we do make a product, a product called a moisture vapor treatment. It's a water-based epoxy that can be installed over concrete that is high in moisture, in excess of 80%, and then you can install your epoxy terrazzo over the top of that. We've come a long way from... 50, 60 years ago, where how did we test for moisture? I don't know, some of you senior spec writers in the room don't have to 
show show yourselves. But uh, we used to uh, we used to tape down some plastic with some duct tape, and you came back the next morning, and if you saw some little water bubbles under it, you thought there were, then there was moisture in the concrete. So then we went to calcium chloride testing. That tells you what's at the surface of the concrete. The problem is we want to know what's going to be coming in a year from now. How much concrete is in, at the bottom of that four inch concrete slab? And that's what relative humidity testing does for us. It's a drilled hole into the concrete, roughly every 1,000 square feet on center, and probes uh, are put in there. So you see, basically, after this machine is pulled out, that little yellow piece here is a cap. It, it caps the surface here, and then the contractor, can, the terrazzo or installer, will come back periodically and pop the cap, stick the probe in the concrete, and test for humidity. But this is an important, critical element for a spec writer, and that you want to have testing for relative humidity in your spec. How about con concrete preparation? We'll go back to how it was years ago and how we evolved. Years ago, we dumped acid and water on the floor, and it bubbled up and it ate the concrete up a little bit, and then we kind of hosed it off and cleaned it as much as possible, but there was a lot of acid latents on the surface, etc., and it really didn't give a profile that you can get with some newer methods, and that was it. Then we evolved into grinding, and really there are two steps that are suggested by the TT Mac to this day, which is grinding, mechanical grinding, a 24 grit, very abrasive or greater, and or probably the optimal way to prep, prep concrete is shot blasting to a three to five profile, as you see here, this shot blaster, and you see the clear difference. How about on the left of the machine? You don't see any crack right here. After you shot blast, look at the normal shrinkage crack that has been exposed in that concrete subfloor. That can be addressed with an anti-fracture membrane before you put your terrazzo topping over it. So you see the penny is just there to give you a perspective of scope. Unshot blasted on the right, shot blasted on the left. So we want a tooth, if you will, something to bite or grab onto for that epoxy to sink in there, grab onto the surface, and make sure it lasts what we promise it to you last, the life of the building. Those little BBs, those little dots on there are little metal ball bearings, if you will. That's shot, that shot material that is run through that machine, projected at the surface, and basically explodes the concrete to give it a good profile to grab for a bond. On those normal cracks that open up, we will fill them with a fill material, 100% solid rigid epoxy, before we go over it with an anti-fracture membrane primer, etc. Prime the subfloor. Use membrane as needed. So I said suggested 10 to 15% coverage for a spec writer. Put that in your spec. Put in relative humidity testing in your spec. If you're assuming 10 to 15% coverage of an anti-fracture membrane, you shouldn't have a callback for more money. Assume there's going to be normal shrinkage cracks and address them accordingly. You want to, uh, we can go over joint detailing. There are some great resources available to give you support on that. Epoxy terrazzo, like any interior finish, will not hold the building together. So you have to address that. Whether it's a back-to-back -back divider strip filled with elastomeric joint filler for expansion contraction, um, certainly any expansion joints must be honored, and usually there's at least a quarter-inch or half-inch gap that is left, and then we fill that with joint filler. Joint filler can be replaced easily if the building moves. When there's not a divider strip and there's a crack through the terrazzo, it's aesthetically a little bit more difficult and a little bit more labor intensive to fix that because generally you have to remove a whole panel and re pour the panel. Okay, 
I do have uh, the installation. Let's see if we go through here. The day one of the uh, NC State School of Design Terrazzo project, uh, what we're doing right now is setting up our shot blasting equipment. Uh, step one to the uh, slab preparation is the shot blast. What we're going to do is open up the cement, uh, take the topping off of the concrete so that we get a good bond to the floor. Uh, why don't we go inside and see what the guys are doing getting prepared. Day two, we've got several activities taking place. Uh, last night, we determined that the slab had some excessive shrinkage cracking. So what we did was we went ahead and applied a full coverage membrane with fiberglass mesh reinforcement, as you can see in the background. Uh, we let that cure overnight. Came in this morning, and we've started several activities at the same time. Did layout, as you can see from the chalk lines that we've applied. Uh, back in the back corner of the room, we've got a gentleman uh, applying the divider strips. He's cutting those right now and setting them into place. Behind me, you can see Roy and his crew doing some fill material. We had a slight elevation difference in the slabs, so they're making up that difference right now. We're going to then continue on with strip installation and hopefully by this afternoon be pouring terrazzo. Here we are on day three. Uh, up to this point, we've got our installation of our divider strips, our prefabricated aluminum inlays around the border of the room, and we've begun pouring colors, as you can see in the background. Uh, pouring some more colors the rest of the day, finish that up, and by day four, we'll be grinding. <laughs> Pour one color at a time. We'll pour an adjacent color. So the red was probably poured the day before, then they came in and did the blue. That's how you don't have, you have a clear separation of color. And when they grind it, it will all be very clearly distinct difference. Those terrazzo grinders are probably five, six, seven hundred pounds, depending on the size of them. So you need some big dudes, the badass terrazzo guys. There they are. Day four, we've begun the grinding process. Right now, the grinding crew is rough cutting the terrazzo, and they'll continue to work their way through the finer grit stones until achieving the desired finish. Once we seal the floor, the project's complete. Let's head down and watch some magic happen. Okay, so generally, you're at about a four-step grind, which is a 24 grit, an 80 grit, a 120 grit, and a 220 grit, and then they'll put a sealer on it afterwards. So if you notice the surface, it's, it looks like it's dirty, then it's clean, then it's dirty, then it's clean. It's because it's in between the grits of the polishing process, all assembled on the project. Okay. there we go, your beautiful terrazzo floor. Okay, so you, you see, you saw the various steps, install your strips, mix your chips, pour it into place, make it smooth, grind it with the various grits, and you see poured on the right and 
after it's ground on the left, seal it, and there you go. Your terrazzo finish. So, are there any questions that you would like to ask about terrazzo flooring? Alive and well in not only the province of Ontario, but many of the others as well. Sir, if I guess you would have to come up to the microphone, I've been instructed, I apologize. Rules were meant to be broken, right, Roger? But I guess I don't want to get in trouble. Yes, sir. Please explain how you get the curved base. Okay, there's, there's a, two options, which is poured in place terrazzo and precast. So when it's, e either way, it's essentially the same concept. When it's poured in place, they actually make a trowel that has a 3 8 radius on it. They add a product called Cabasil to the mix of terrazzo. It doesn't change the color, it's a thickening agent. And it allows the contractor to trowel terrazzo vertically without it sagging back down. So they will, they will pour the terrazzo up to about four inches from the wall. Then they will make the special mix with the Cabasil same exact color, and they will trowel with that cove trowel and install the base that way. The option to that is precast, and it is essentially done the same way, but it's manufactured, pre-manufactured at a plant to be determined, and they're generally in four foot, five foot, or six foot lengths. Any other questions? For, uh, yes, ma'am the grinding and the polishing of the corners and the edges, it's probably difficult for those big machines to get there. And when someone comes later by hand, yes. how do those blend together? The color, of course, will be very similar. The finish, we ask your humble and gracious flexibility in that it, you are absolutely correct. It has to be polished and ground by hand. So they use the same grits, but if it's 8 o'clock in the morning and this person has been grinding base all day. They might be applying a little pressure and a little different than 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, etc. So there might be some inconsistencies. You might find a little swirl mark here and there, but after it is sealed and completed, you should be virtually the same. And that's where we ask as a trade, please have a little flexibility with us in that uh, to take a sample of terrazzo and go like this, terrazzo was never intended that way. So look at it as the beauty and elegance of the project that's going to last the life of the building. So that's it. We, we, we get pretty darn close, though. But I, after 25 years, you can't, just can't help yourself but put a couple of disclaimers in there. Uh, my question is also about grinding. I mean, you have your divider strips, and then you pour your mix. How do you keep from grinding the strips themselves? And if you do, are they damaged? Ah, you actually do grind the strips as okay. well. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a um, can be a comical question for the new guy. So uh, the new guy that's pouring terrazzo, you know, it's kind of a learning curve. You know, education is never free. So it's, it's, it's kind of a talent, and that's why usually there's the helper and then the mechanic. So the helper will gets to mix the stuff, gets to do the heavy work, the grunt work, and then the mechanic installs the terrazzo topping on the floor with the trowels. But you get the new guy on there sometimes just to give him a little, you don't let him go too far, but you want, you, you, what they do is they pour the terrazzo just above those strips, and then when they come in with the grinders, grind it evenly so that it's all the same. And then the new guy thing is, then he'll come in and he'll put too much mix on the top in an area, and he'll be grinding all day the next day. But you've got to grind down to those strips, and you essentially make it ver you know, very smooth. Okay. Last question. Yeah, Ramsey, I'm a civil engineer. What is, in terms of cost, what is the difference between the uh, epoxy terrazzo and the regular terrazzo? Um, I am going to phone a friend. So uh, sand cushion terrazzo, 5,000 feet, epoxy terrazzo, 5,000 feet, same aggregate mix. We said $30 for epoxy terrazzo, sand cushion. 
40? 30 compared to 40. Thank you very much for your time.